future isn't frightening if you, well, know the future. Let's talk about end times and what comes next with Max Lucado on Steve Brown, etc. He's, he's an old white guy, an author, broadcaster, and seminary professor who's sick of religion. And he's brought friends. Please welcome Steve Brown, etc. Hey, we are so glad you're here that you would take time to sit at our table, even though we don't let you talk. Uh, you always have a place, and uh, it is a high and holy compliment that you would give us this time. Um, in case you're wondering, I'm Steve, the aforementioned old white guy. Matthew Porter is the executive producer, and he's here. You just got back from a special event. Yes. Uh, this last weekend, we were up in the Panhandle of Florida celebrating my grandmother's birthday. She is 100. Oh, wow. Two. Oh, wow. Yeah. I'm, clo <laughs> I'm close. I can make it. <laughs> Closing in. Our producer, Jeremy, is in the little glass booth. Jeremy's band recently performed, and it's amazing. What, what happened? What, how many people? For your 4th of July. Uh, for 4th of July. Oh, 200,000, I think. 200,000 people. Jeez. I hope you did well. I It'd don't be know. awful to make a fool of yourself in front of 200,000 people. He's so humble, he won't say. I know. <laughs> and our one-man IT department, John Myers, is in the tech bunker. John says no one has ever tried hacking the Key Life website. And he's starting to feel a bit slighted. <laughs> and then we have a special guest, Ray Cortese, who started a church in the middle of nowhere a field where you found cows and before long they had a cathedral a mega church and god has used him in a great way and we were together this morning and i said sit in so ray it's good to have you with us thanks steve good to be here and uh george, dr george bingham is here he's president of key life george wants you to know key life accepts donations in the form of checks and credit cards and also gold dust, Bitcoin, <laughs> <laughs> commemorative plates from the Franklin Mint, All right. et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> and Kathy Wyatt is the soft feminine side of the program. Kathy says today is National Lazy Day, and if you're making plans to celebrate it, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> 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 and we have a great guest today, Max Lucado, one of our favorite people in the world. He entered the ministry before many of you were born in 1978, served churches in Miami, Texas, South America. He currently serves as teaching minister at Oak Hills Church in San Antonio. Max is also, as you know, unless you're living on Mars, is a New York Times best-selling author with more than 145 million books in print. Good heavens. Max is, I've got four. <laughs> <laughs> Max's latest book, which I hold in my nicotine-stained fingers, is What Happens Next, A Traveler's Guide through the end of the age. Max, you have a supernatural ability to have a well-timed book. The world's falling apart. <laughs> I mean, uh, there's war going on in Israel, and as we speak, they're getting ready to attack them. We have a uh, third world war going on in our politics here. In fact, America could go down tomorrow, uh, and my car broke. It's just not, no. it's just not, I'm, I need this book. Uh, uh, where, this is not part of what you usually do. What happened? Mm. Well, good morning to you from a hotel somewhere in Southern California, where I'm out talking to people about um, what happens next. It's always a treat to see each and every one of you, and I'd be remiss if I didn't always reflect back on the days that we shared South Florida together. Yeah. The first church I served was in a little Havana, 
and our next door neighbors uh, in an apartment building there in Coconut Grove said, well, if you ever have a free Sunday, visit the Key Biscayne Presbyterian Church. And I said, well, you don't get a lot of free Sundays, but I did get one. And you got and saved that's when there, I first right? Heard you first. <laughs> Do what? You got saved there, right? I got to say, it, w- sure. it would help me sell books if you'd say that. Uh, I'll tell you what, it got, it got me saved from being a little too stodgy. I'll say that. Well, what I never about did this take book? up pipe smoking, though. I, that was the one thing that... Uh, well, I'm glad to have helped. <laughs> You're going to die of cancer, and it's my fault. Hey, listen, ser- seriously, this is kind of different. Uh, yes, sir. What happened? Uh, why did you write it? Two things. Uh, what you just said, just the craziness of the world has got me fascinated with studying just the different approaches toward end times, toward prophecy. Um, as you said, even today, Iran is rattling their sabers against Israel, and um, we've got wars with uh, Russia and Ukraine. There's threats of wars with China and Taiwan. The United States is apparently about to slide into a recession. I wish I had not read that today. Me too. <laughs> that was this yeah. morning. Yeah. That was just today. Yeah. And the political chaos. And so I, I know, I know that could be said about every day, every era, every generation every century um but it has become a fascination of mine because i think things are just moving in such a fragile state and then part of it too steve uh my next birthday is number 70 and so i i have found myself increasingly just uh, insatiably curious about what i'm about to enter into mm. i'm genuinely excited i really am i i i, I wouldn't say i I can't wait to die, but I have no fear of death anymore. One of the great benefits of of studying in times is you end up studying the sovereignty of God and the the promise that he will guide us and take us home. And so um, uh, I, I, over the last decade or so, began reading different approaches towards end times and uh, found a few things that I'd always believed that I still believe, found a few things that I'd always believed that I discontinued and went a little different direction. Uh, but you know, it's just been fascinating and I love talking about it. You know, you're, you're, you're ironic about this. I, uh, you know, I've opened the book and came first to your timeline and I said, Oh no, not Max too. We're going to end up fighting about things like the millennium and the rapture. And I'm going to have to show him where I'm right. And he's wrong, but it's not that kind of book. It's a book that is really civil, ironic, and one that will give you hope. And we need it right now. I don't know if you'll look forward to death. And you certainly don't want to go on Thursday, but when you're cramming for finals, this book is a really helpful book. I hope so. I really do. Last thing I want to be is contentious. Last thing I want to do is be uh, dogmatic and opinionated. In fact, in the acknowledgments, I say that I just have a, a chair reserved in heaven at the PW poets cafe that's preachers who preach on the end times and that's where we will all gather and laugh and say oh we thought we had it all figured out but nobody really cracks the code um and and all i'm hoping to do steve is just say well let's let's look at it this way perhaps this approach but everything has to be held in such reverence and such acknowledgement that that uh you know, we've been discussing this since Christ ascended into heaven, and nobody today is going to get it all figured out. But that doesn't preclude the importance of just good, healthy conversations. I agree. I I was having dinner with the late Addison Leach, who was then the academic dean at Gordon Conwell, and the student came up to him, asked him something about the millennium or the rapture, and he said, "Son, I don't know." He said, you know what I think is going to happen? Somebody is probably going to be a layman. Uh, and and they're going to come up with the answer, and everybody's going to say, hey, we didn't see that. That's right. Mm. Well, nobody has, but today. 
<laughs> Max Lucado has finally done it. <laughs> <laughs> Darn, the laymen missed their chance. Yeah, <laughs> the lay people missed their yeah, chance. chance. What do you want? Has this book been out long enough to get responses on it? No, sir. It's just coming out right now. Uh, now, I did present this series of messages to our church. Uh -huh. And our church comes out of a strong Reformed tradition. And I've ended up in a more of a premillennial position. Those are some fancy terms if we ever need to unpack those. But I tried to be careful as I presented the messages and say, now, this is just my take. There's several different understandings, a variety of different interpretations. This is where I've landed. And that I think people appreciated that, and that did lead to some wonderful uh, dialogue with a variety of our church members. Oh, and I'm I still bet. on the staff, so I didn't make them do that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, guys, we're going to be going into details as we go along. If you're dispensational and not reformed and are big on the rapture, uh, I don't think that will cause you to lose your salvation, but I wouldn't take a chance if I were you. <laughs> and and if, if you're right, uh, grab me on the way up, okay? I just don't want to miss it. Hey guys, the name of the book is What Happens Next? A Traveler's Guide Through the End of the Age. It's eschatology, but something that you're going to like a lot and discuss it with small groups in your church. Don't go anywhere. Max Lucado, uh, his latest book is called What Happens Next? A Traveler's Guide Through the End of the Age. I know that for 2,000 years we have debated these issues, and finally somebody has written a book <laughs> that will settle it all. <laughs> Max, before the break, you kind of uh, alluded to this a little bit. Um, you know, as to why study this, you know, there's the old preacher joke about is it uh, is it pre tribulation? Is it pan tribulation? And the pastor goes, uh, I, I'm I'm uh, I'm pan tribulation. I think it's all going to pan out. <laughs> so I think there's an easy way to go. Listen, who can say for sure? Wouldn't it make more sense? Don't we have enough issues to deal with in the in the present versus kind of having an eye towards the future? So speak to that mindset, if you would. And, and that's a, exactly a mindset that, that many people have, and that's okay. That's okay. You know, this is not something that, uh, in addition to all the other things that churches tend to do to make people feel bad, the last thing I want to do is say, if you don't want to tackle the topic of end times, you're less than a, no less than a believer. Just trust Jesus. He's going to make it all work out. He, he, he is absolutely... Uh, not basing our salvation upon anybody's interpretation of end times. What I found is it is invigorating. If you lift yourself, if you unburden yourself with from the uh, obligation of, I got to figure it out, and if I'm wrong, I'm in trouble, uh, uh, then, then you unburden yourself of that, then it gets exciting. You, you know, you can say, oh, okay, here's one take on the thousand year reign of Christ. Or here's one take on the tribulation. Here's another take on the rapture. Oh, I didn't know that so and so taught that, you know, or or so and so was a well known uh premillennialist. It, it it really it really is, I think, fascinating. Now I, I acknowledge that end times or eschatology is kind of like the Serengeti of theology. It's where the <laughs> it's where the wild things happen. It's where the numbers are, right? It's where the beasts are. And it's tip, typically attracts big game hunters. And big game hunters like to have a swagger about themselves. And and uh they they like to 
present oh, almost like they know more about Christ's return than Christ does. So <laughs> you've got to, got to watch out for that. I acknowledge that. On the other hand, there are some wonderful, sincere lovers of Jesus who have genuine agreements and disagreements on this discussion. What I found in as I dove into it about five or six years ago is that my own faith got excited. I, I have found myself increasingly animated. Uh, I, 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 now that I think there'll be a thousand year reign, I, I can't quit reading about the millennium, you know, and I'm, I'm really at peace with the idea of a rapture. Although for 40 years, I told people, no, there's not going to be a rapture, but I don't want, last thing I want to do is argue about it, but I love talking about it. I, I love it. Even now as we're talking, I feel a few gus, goosebumps on my arm thinking maybe, maybe today. Maybe today, yeah. because I, I do think our redemption is drawing near one way or another. And that is such a wonderful hope to give a hope starved society. Mm -hmm. Max, I want to go to a completely, uh, completely different subject for a minute. I um, uh, I'm going to tell you my story. Um, yesterday was a terrible day. I spent it in airports waiting to get home. It was not a pleasant mm -hmm. experience, but um, I got home. So, um, but you have, you tell the story in your, in your book, I was re reading this morning about the, uh, about the plane crash in Columbia, at which point I said, you really don't have anything to complain about, about your nasty day yesterday, because at <laughs> least you got home in one piece. You're not, you know, the bottom of the ocean, but you, in that story, um, anyway, you elaborate on that story in the book. What, what, why did you include that in the book and what can that particular story teach us? Are you talking about the story of that private plane that went down yes. carrying yeah. the kids? Yes. Is that not a fascinating story? Yes. Right? Yes. It's just, it's just a beautiful illustration, I think, of, of, of how God is pursuing us. So the short version is that a plane goes down, the adults on the plane perish, uh, and when the uh, Colombian forces find the airplane, they're in the heart of the Amazon jungle, they find the bodies of the adults, but apparently there were four children on the plane and they're nowhere to be seen. And so they set out for a search. And this search lasts, if you might have to check me on this, Kathy, it's been a while since I read the story, but I think 40 days, mm. 40 days, they search for these kids. Now, these kids had grown up on the edge of the Amazon jungle. So they knew something about what to avoid and, and what to do. Uh, it dawned on the search crews that perhaps the kids were avoiding them. And that's exactly uh, what they were doing. They did not know if the search crew was on their side or against them, friend or foe. And so as it turns out, they, uh, they were hiding. Every time that there was a member of the search crew or search party near, they would, they would duck into the jungle. But here's what the when they realized that, here, here's, and here's the beauty of this story. They rescued the kids by asking the grandmother a familiar voice to the kids, a welcoming, loving, familiar voice. They asked her to record a message, and they lowered speakers down into the jungle. And the message said, these people are here to help you. They're here to save you. Trust them and come home. Now, if that's not a beautiful sermon illustration, oh, oh my gosh, a, a preacher is just, <laughs> <laughs> and that, that's what God has done for us. That's yeah. what, he has entered our world in the familiar voice of a wonderful Savior saying, trust me, trust me. I will come and get you and take you to be with me where I am. And, and again, that's the big story of eschatology. Right. That's the happy, strong, how exactly how he comes. Let us keep discussing that. But the big idea is the gospel is a God who enters the jungle of our world. We have collapsed. We have fallen into sin, but we have a familiar voice inviting us to come out and go home with him. Oh, what a great story. You know, I have been promised by Jesus. <laughs> 
well, you can laugh, <laughs> but I'm going to have hair in heaven. <laughs> All right. <laughs> that is hope, right? It's, it's, it is a hopeful right. thing to do. I, you know, Miracles can happen. Yeah, they <laughs> really can. And we're going to be restored. And, you know, you guys mm-hmm. can do your muscles and stuff, but I want hair. <laughs> your and hair. I, and if it takes that to make you happy in heaven, then it will be mine. At least after reading Max's book, I get the feeling that whatever it takes is going to be okay. (laughs) Hey, listen, if you avoid books on the end times, if you grow tired of the arguments and the fights, if you have ruled out other Christians because their views don't go with your views, then it's time you got a good book about the end times that you're going to love. This is a book that you can use with a small group in your church and talk about what's going to happen next. That's the title of it, What Does Happen Next, by Max Lucado. Guys, um, speaking of Jesus returning, just like that, we're going to return to. out with Max Lucado. You can uh, you can keep up with Max at maxlucado.com. It's not very creative, but you can get to it easily and on social media at Max Lucado. Max, um, and really appreciate your book. Uh, the um, When we're talking about the end times, most of us, first thing we think of is uh, Revelation. But you really do a, you know, talking big picture. You really cover the entire scripture uh, with references um, that relate to the end times. Can you kind of give us a, a, you know, big picture overview of of your, the timeline mm-hmm. that has kind of organized your book? Yeah. Well, thank you for that question. I think one of the most prophetic books is the book of Genesis. We don't really think of the creation story as a as a story of, of prophecy. Uh, but when we take it in the context of our God as a covenant-keeping God, and that He does declare the end uh, from the beginning, uh, and that He does not change His mind, and that He is sovereign, and what he has declared will be, if we embrace those truths, which I believe we do, then it allows us to look at the story of the creation, uh, not just as an image of what was intended to be, but also a promise of what will be, what will be. Adam and Eve messed up, yes, but God, did he change his mind? Uh, Did he say, well, that was not very a good plan, so I'll have to come up with a new one? Um, I, I hold to the belief that our God knows the end from the beginning and that he will have his garden. And so if you want a beautiful image of what our lives will be like for eternity, start with the, the image of Adam and Eve in a perfect paradise, in perfect bodies, in a perfect relationship with their heavenly father. No sin, no shame, no regrets, no hurt, no hate. It's just a picture, a portrait there. I I like starting um, eschatology, the study of end things, with protology, the study of first things. And and, and I believe that really sets us up to to go into the topic a, 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 a little calmer. We tend to jump right to the book of Daniel or right to the the book of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, or we go to the book of Revelation. And those are tough books. I mean, I'm, they're, they're hard. But if we can begin with this image of, of our paradise is described in the beginning, then we can, I think, start working out uh, mo- more of a timeline. And the only reason I did uh, a timeline is because this is what I, helped me in my own study 
um, looking at the major milestone events in history, like the prophecy of of Daniel, what what the angel Gabriel told Daniel, I think is very important. I think the covenants that God made with Abraham, uh, with with uh, with David, uh, really the covenant with Adam and Eve. Uh, the covenants made through the book of Jeremiah. I think those have to be taken into consideration. Um, and then, and then it, once we've kind of laid those foundations, we can consider uh, what 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 paradise is like. That to me is was one of the most delightful discoveries. I had never heard a sermon on paradise, and now I can't quit talking about paradise. And then after that, the rapture, the tribulation. And now here's where we get into the. A little more controversial discussion, discussions, uh, the return of Christ, and and then the great white throne judgment, and finally the eternal state. Um, it it seemed to work for me. Again, I'm not dogmatic about the sequence, and I'm never going to arm wrestle with anybody over it. But it sure helped me uh, to, and it gets me more excited about it. Just yesterday, I preached at a church out here in California uh, on paradise, and it just. Uh, it's so wonderful to see so many people who don't know what their loved ones are doing right now uh, to ponder at least the possibility that they're enjoying that unspeakable realm uh, that awaits us all. Oh, man, that's so good. And for those of you who are young, you're listening to an old preacher who's cramming for finals. And this is the way we talk when we get to that place because it is mm -hmm. a grand and wonderful hope. Helps you sleep Amen. better at night, doesn't it, Max? It does. It does. It does. Man, I got caught on the tarmac the other day and and uh, came out with a great sermon illustration. You know, we preachers, anything will be a potential sermon illustration, right? <laughs> True. Stuck for four hours on the tarmac in Chicago with a storm outside and planes lined up and the pilot was not communicating well. Four hours in the dark. And I thought, no wonder, no wonder uh, we have the mental health issues in the world that we have today, because many people, that's their view of life. We're stuck. We're not going anywhere. And we need the pilot to talk to us. And uh, when the pilot finally said, we're about to take off, you could hear a sigh of relief. And I look around our world today, and I see especially our young people, and I know they're battling anxiety and battling depression. And everything inside of me wants to say, you know, these brief and momentary troubles, they're really not worth comparing with the glory that outweighs them all. If we could set our eyes on the redemption that awaits us, what joy that could bring. Oh, man. And one of the best ways to do that is to get this book, What Happens Next, A Traveler's Guide Through the End of the Age, or This Age. And when you're stuck on the airplane and they're not taking off and you're suicidal if you have this book in your attache case you'll do better then you'll rise up and thank max Thanks for spending time with us. Uh, we're hanging out with Max Lucado in his new book, What Happens Next. Uh, by the way, do you get our weekly Key Life email? Not only will it encourage you, it'll also clear up your skin and take 10 strokes <laughs> off your golf game. Um, and you, you need this. Uh, try it for yourself. Just go to keylife.org slash subscribe. My friend uh, Ray Cortese, pastor of Seven Rivers Presbyterian Church, is here. And uh, Ray, you had something to ask. Yeah, Max, your description of uh, paradise in the book, I think, is so timely because people are, you know, we live in the great de-churching moment, and the idea is people are fleeing from church uh, everywhere, churches are emptying out, and yet the truth is, I think the church has never had a greater opportunity because 
people know that government's not providing uh, the answers, education, the university system's not going to bail us out, the tech industry is not necessarily our friend, and people are walking through the doors of our churches, uh, honestly, um, hungry, anxious, um, and uh, we're sitting on this great opportunity, and I, I love the description of paradise, uh, really um, uh, taking the book of uh, Genesis and uh, helping people see um, the future that God has planned, that there's a garden, there's a feast, this is where it's all going. And then the importance, uh, I might ask you to, uh, how important is it for the local church, a sense, to be a physical embodiment of that, that people might believe the truth of that, uh, that the church is actually, they get a taste of the new heavens and the new earth when they walk into a church of Jesus Christ. Mm. Ray, what a great question. And thank you. For, thank you for asking that. You know, when I was a, a kid growing up in desolate West Texas, um, my dad planned these uh, summer vacations for us in which we would go camping uh, in either New Mexico or Colorado. It was a pretty good drive, eight or 10 hour drive. Uh, but the very minute he started talking about that trip, the um, the atmosphere in the house changed. We just got excited. We started asking him questions. Uh, here's a statement that will predate me. He pulled out a real physical map and showed us <laughs> what's how that? to. Uh, <laughs> what's the map? And and uh, if anybody had walked into the Lakato house when my dad was talking about where he's taking us, they would have sensed that we were genuinely happy. We were excited because our father was taking us somewhere. I, I like what you're asking, Ray. I, I think that the church should be like that. It's a mess outside. It's a mess. There's chaos on every corner. But here's a family of people who believe their father has great plans for them. Uh, our our father is taking us somewhere, and it does something. It activates. It it animates. It, you know what? Also, it purifies. It causes us to to lead a a, a a a pursue a holy life. We want to be uh, uh, ready when when Christ uh, calls us home. And so I love that. Uh, somebody once said that heaven is the green vegetable on the spiritual diet. And the more we fix our minds on things to come, the more we set our hearts on the return of Christ. I believe that lifts our spirits, don't you? I, I, I feel like it's just essential that we uh, continually feed our church the promise of eternal life. Such good stuff. Yeah, what well, you had a question. Sorry, I don't want to. Oh. I don't want to duck it, but you had a question. I don't want to. Oh, I don't uh, want it to slip past. Just, we were we were talking uh, during the break about uh, the significance of uh, Israel mm -hmm. in you know in your book in terms of a foundational kind of yeah. point, especially looking forward to the end times maybe sooner than the church was able to before. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah. And this is one of those discussions, you know, that the uh, church has been having, um, <laughs> boy, long before I came around. Uh, I, I do I do lean in toward that uh, point of view that says something happened when Israel was uh, reinstated as a nation uh, that that signals that we're getting closer and closer uh, to the end times. There are several prophecies in Scripture uh, that can only be fulfilled if Israel is uh, a nation. And so what happened in, in 1948, it's, it is often called a super sign. It was a significant moment in the, in the progression of history. Uh, I do tend to fall. I realize that not everybody does, but it seems to me that when when we begin talking about the signs of the times and that the Jesus described the the end times or the signs as birth pains and that they will increase in frequency and intensity, uh, that began with with the reinstatement of Israel as a nation. And that allows then for many of the prophecies that, uh, that are made uh, to to have the potential to be to be realized, and so uh, 
Yeah, I've I've moved into that camp that would say I think we're not just in the end times, but we're in the end of the end times. Um, I'm I'm longing for the return of Christ. I'm watching closely what's happening uh, to Israel. I'm remembering some of the prophecies from the book of Ezekiel that in the end times Israel will be surrounded by enemies. Um, I do not know the day. I do not know the hour. It could be a thousand years from now. This could just be a you know a, a stirring that calms down. But uh, then again, I'm I'm living with one eye toward the sky, uh, <laughs> and and I feel a sense of urgency. Now, can I just add quickly a healthy urgency, a happy urgency. Uh, about five or six years ago, I thought, well, when I get to be 70 years of age, I'm, I think I'll slow down. And now I'm 70 years of age, and I feel like I need to press faster, do more, N not out of fear or guilt. I, I just, I, I really want more people in heaven than I ever have. And I'm, and I'm, I'm thrilled to be able to share this story. Is, um, is eschatology a tool of evangelism? Yes, sir. I think it's a great tool. When when we studied, we devoted about four months uh, to studying ex eschatology. <laughs> I can say the word, can I? It's the eschatology. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what it means, but I can say the word. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I personally think if you if you approach it from a non dogmatic point of view, you know, if you just say, "Here's what I think," but what we know for sure is that Christ is coming, the the saved will be living, and those who reject Christ will be separated from him forever. We can agree on those four issues and come back and hammer those in, but then present exciting news of what it's going to be like when we see Christ's return. What is it going to be like when uh, we actually are reunited with the loved ones? What is the new heaven? What is the new earth? and just look, present these stories. We, we saw more conversions during our teaching of end times than of any in recent past. Oh, man. Wow. Max, we're out of time. I don't know no. where it went. Yeah, we are. Hey, are you, you've not let me brag on Steve Brown yet. Maybe we can go a little I, longer. I subscribed to Steve Brown tapes while I'm, I was in Brazil. I you, was, you not, <laughs> hey, you're my favorite you, preacher, man. Steve. I know. Tell people you were saved by my ministry. <laughs> That always is true when Max is with us. And I've known Max uh, probably before you were born. And everything he writes blesses me deeply and profoundly. It's kind of anointed. And what you heard on that interview is exactly the way he is. If you were having dinner with him, it would be exactly the kind of thing we just experienced. And one of the real true, and Ray Cortez has been with us, is that way too. I mean, what you hear in the pulpit is exactly what you would hear if you were having dinner with him. There aren't two personae, one a religious one that says God, and another one <laughs> that is a real person who says God. And uh, Max is that. I had a, when I was growing up, there was a Bible study that an, an older lady Aunt Gordy, we called her. She lived on top of a mountain, looked out over the city of Asheville. And every morning she would get up, go to her kitchen, open up the windows of her kitchen, look out over the city and say, Jesus, maybe today, maybe today. And I'm convinced that one of the reasons God used her was the hope she had. So if you were listening today, you know to say maybe today. Who's going to be on next week? Next week, we are turning, flipping the clock. Totally different. Um, Karen Hall is going to be with us, and she's written a book called The Sound of Silence, 
the life and canceling of a heroic Jesuit priest. Now figure that one out. For a Protestant program. For a Protestant program. Yep. And she's mad. She's really mad. And we're going to have to deal, George, with all the suits that will follow, <laughs> the legal actions that will be taken against us for having this woman on. A lot of people wouldn't, but we are. and Because um, we have no sense. Yeah, because <laughs> we, yeah, it was something I was smoking at the time uh, when we were doing that. But anyway, that's a good book, The Sound of Silence. And she doesn't mince words. And she also documents everything that she says. And it will be an interesting interview, and you miss it. Somebody will say, I can't believe that you missed that. Next well, week, it'll be different for yeah, sure. It'll be different. We've never done anything like this before, mm-hmm. so that's kind of fun. Yeah. Next week, same time, same place. Hope you join us between now and then. Don't do anything we wouldn't, and that gives you a wide, wide berth.